Northfleet has become increasingly invisible over the last 40 years, and we hope to not only stop that trend, but reverse it. Because Northfleet is very important, and it is also very large. It is the second largest parish in what is now Gravesham. It's nearly 4,000 acres, and it consists of many interesting parts. Apart from Norfleet itself, which of course is focused around the hill, you have the new town of Rocheville, created in the 1850s. From the 1870s onwards, you have Norfleet itself ever growing, this time westward, down towards the border with Swanscombe, and also ever southward towards the hamlet of Perry Street, which is also inside Norfleet. And also, it merges imperceptibly nowadays into Gravesend. In addition to Perry Street, you have Isted Rise, you have Nash Street, you have Norfleet Green, and most importantly of all, perhaps from a historical perspective, you have Spring Head on the border of Norfleet, Swanscombe and Southfleet, where was situated, of course, Vagniarchi, the ancient Roman town on the Watling Street. So Norfleet must never be considered a suburb of Gravesend, nor should it be considered as being purely a creation of the Industrial Revolution. It is much older and much more important than that. The view that you're looking at is dated about 1910 and it is of the creek at Norfleet where the river Ebsleet meets the Thames and the Thames is the great highway of history culture, politics and everything else you could possibly think of Norfleet flows directly into this and this is part of its history for the last hundred years or so this area has become increasingly abandoned, decayed and overgrown Yet the creek is the very DNA of Norfleet. Its very beginnings as a place are in this very area. But one must remember this was also the very area that housed Orm House, a great mansion used by Charles II as his riverside residence during the latter part of the 17th century. The picture that you're looking at is not, in fact, a castle at all. It's a Victorian construction, because Northfleet never had a castle, although it did have a fort. This particular structure was created by the Pitcher family as an entrance to Northfleet Dockyard, which was created in 1788, launching its first ship, the Royal Charlotte, the following year in 1789. It was a major employer of Norfleet. 2,000 people worked in the dockyard at its height during the mid-19th century. Greatly helped, of course, by the demand from all over the world for ships. Not only from the British Navy, but also from the East India Company, the West India Company, the Kingdom of Sardinia, from Chile, Russia and many other countries as well. The dockyard really reached its pinnacle during the Crimea War in the 1850s. Thereafter, with the lack of demand, the whole system collapsed, the dockyard went bankrupt, and William Pitcher was obliged to close it in 1860. It was, of course, the industrialisation of cement manufacturing in Norfleet that changed it from a village into a town and there was lots of money to be made. So much so that by the 1890s there were perhaps as many as eight independent cement factories in Northfleet all vying with each other, sometimes occasionally even violently, not just economically. In 1900 these were all combined into the APCM, the Associated Portland Cement Manufacturers, later to become Blue Circle and now known as Lafarge. The view that you can see in this picture is an incredibly important event in our lifetime in modern Norfleet's history and all to do with how it feels as a town about itself. And that is the blowing of the cement work chimneys in March 
2010. The chimneys were, of course, part of the brand new Norfleet cement works, which was created in 1969 and 1970. So in themselves, they were not terribly historical. But it's what they represented that was so important. Because in March 2010, cement hadn't been produced at Norfleet for probably about two years before that, and both chimneys hadn't been in operation for an even longer period. But the blowing of those chimneys left Norfleet bereft of the very industry, the very thing that created the modern town. It was now Norfleet without cement, like rhubarb without custard. Ah, the factory club. The building was built entirely at the expense of Thomas Bevan, the great cement manufacturer, and it was deliberately created as a cultural centre for Norfleet. It had an enormous hall in which dances could be held, concerts, political meetings, plays, anything you like. It had an organ down in the cellar. There were more rooms for billiards and snooker. The first public library in Northfleet was actually in one of the rooms in the cellar. Out the back, there was a swimming pool. But the other reason that Thomas built this building at the cost of £11,000 was it showed what concrete and cement could actually do. Rather than building a Stalinist boring block that so often we see today, this is all full of design, twiddly bits, extra details, as if you like a three-dimensional advertisement for what his industry and his product could do. So it is now one of the most significant buildings, not only in Northfleet, but for anywhere that is interested or involved in the Industrial Revolution, and particularly in the cement industry. Lawn Road School, or the Board School, was opened in 1886, and it came in the middle of a time when Northfleet High Street was changing from really a very, very open road with views right over to the River Thames and down into Kent itself, into a place that we now know today and that some of our more historical members of our community can remember as it was before the 1960s. The whole of the sides of both north and south of the High Street were covered with shops, normally with living accommodation above them, and many old footpaths and new roads were built to house the many workers flocking into Norfleet to work in the cement works. So Lawn Road School was very, very much part of Norfleet growing up, and within 30 years it was urbanised into a town. In 1893, the clock tower that you can see on it was created as the first public timepiece in Norfleet, and in fact, the school operated in that building right up until the Great Hurricane of 1987, which destroyed the school building itself and left the clock hanging over the tower like a sword of Damocles. Sadly, all to be cleared away by about 1988, 1989 and replaced with the current newer school set back further away from the road. Norfleet House. Many of you, of course, will remember it as the offices of Norfolk Urban District Council. But it was actually built in 1841 by Thomas Sturge as a private house for his family to live in. In fact, his family were not just involved with cement, they were also involved with whaling. And there were two huge whaling harpoons that formed a very intricate gate to the beginning of the garden path that eventually led up to Sturge's creation. In 1920, Norfleet House was taken over by Norfleet Urban District Council as its offices, and immediately it took on a whole new role because the decisions made in this very building by Norfleet Urban District Council were those that set the modern history of Norfleet as we know it. The animated scene that we can see here 
dates from August 1911 when Mr. Terrar Smith, a local union trade union representative, came to Norfleet to encourage 4,000 men from Norfleet, Swanscombe, Greenhide, Stone and Dartford to form a branch of the National Amalgamated Union of Labour. He said to the men, you must amalgamate just as your employers have amalgamated. If you remember, the cement factories all became one organisation in 1900 called the APCM. And certainly this particular meeting created the largest branch of the National Amalgamated Union of Labour here on the hill. They wanted at that time a 15% increase in peace rates and at least sixpence an hour for workers who were at that time working roughly a 54-hour week for 10 shillings and threepence in conditions which in our world of health and safety would be completely and utterly unacceptable. But the politics behind this, the creation of this event, the fact that there were huge May Day parades in the years before the First World War from Swanscombe, Norfleet through to Grey's End is still reflected in some of the political colour of Norfleet today. And again, it's part not only of politics, but of culture. It's very much part of a place being itself, which is something that Norfleet needs to be. Well, if the creek is the DNA, not to say the womb of Norfleet, then the hill surely is its heart. It was, of course, the site of the village green. The hill, of course, is also the site of St Botolph's Church, Norfleet's ancient parish church, and nearby was the site of Norfleet's original manor house. The village fair was held on this piece of green, which of course is now completely covered in tarmac and concrete. The lockup was also there, as were the stocks. It was very, very much the heart of Norfleet. It is even today an eclectic mix of buildings. But Norfleet Hill is a conservation area. It's still very, very important in that role architecturally of having Norfleet's own personality and independence remembered, retained and indeed promoted. Norfleet is again in a position of huge change, just like it's been so many times in its long and eventful history. The surrounding land of Norfleet is about to be redeveloped into a new town. And this we must take as an opportunity not to bury the Norfleet story, but to resurrect it, blow off the cobwebs and allow us to enjoy not only us, but also future generations, the buildings such as the factory club, areas such as the creek, and so that Norfleet can wake up from its long, long sleep and regain its position once again amongst the great towns and communities of the historical county of Kent. <laughs>